Praise the Lord. Church, I said, praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. We have a full house today because today happens to be a holiday. And those who have not been coming regularly, I welcome you and I pray that this will be a memorable time in your life in Jesus' name. And I encourage you to make the sacrifice and keep coming and the blessings will be yours in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for the faithfulness of the people. And thank you, Lord, for the willingness to come and learn. I pray, Lord, everything we learn will be of tremendous benefit in every area of our lives in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we are studying from Mark chapter 6. I will read him from verse 1 all through to verse 13. I read verses 1 and 2. Mark chapter 6 verse 1. And he went out from this and came into his own country. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence has this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought? By science. As we come to the Bible study, we need to understand that the study of the word brings blessing to everyone. Hearing and studying the word of God, we study its works, we study its will, and we learn of its wonders. And all these normally should produce positive practical results in every life. But there are two kinds of people that hear the word of God. On the one hand, you'll find in what we're studying today, there are people who hear the word of God and they remain the same or even retrogress. That means they go back. They're not as good as they were before. The hearing of the word, the learning of the word in some lives, makes them worse than they were. Why? Why is it that some people hear the word of God and then they remain the same or they retrogress? Number one, the superficial hearers. They hear everything they hear is on the surface of their heart. And when the wind blows, it's like the breeze blowing a sheet of paper from the table superficial. Other people are faithless hearers. They hear and the word is not mixed with faith in them that hear. Others are religious hearers. It's a religion to them to come and hear and go back and come and hear and go back again. And so because they're religious traditional hearers, it has no effect on them. It doesn't change their outlook. It doesn't change their lives. It doesn't change their language. It doesn't change the pattern of their lives. It doesn't change their relationships. It changes nothing. They only hear because they're religious hearers. Other people are dull of hearing. They're dull hearers. It's like they're sleeping while hearing. It's like they're dozing while hearing. And the word does not make any personal, practical, pointed, pungent effect in their lives. Other people are prayerless hearers. Whatever we hear, if we don't take it to the Lord in prayer, 
And if we do not soak it in and sink it in with prayer, it will not make any change in our lives. Other people are nominal hearers. They're like nominal church goers. And they go because that's the routine. They go because that's the thing to do. And because they are nominal hearers, no impact, no influence, no transformation, no change. Others are carnal hearers. They are there to, to compare Paul and Silas, Paul and Apollos, Paul and Timothy, Paul and a bishop, Paul and another apostle. And because of these attitudes of hurt, that's why they do not have or gain or benefit or profit anything. But on the other hand, there are people that learn and study God's word profitably. How is it like that with them? They are awakened learners. The word of God wakes them up, wakes up their heart and their mind, and it brings conviction on them. They are responsive learners. They learn and they respond immediately. And they say, I think I ought to change that area of my life. I think I ought to change that attitude of mine. I think this word I'm learning today is speaking directly to me. They're responsive learners because they're also active learners. They mix the words with faith in their heart. They're active and they do something about what they're hearing. And because of that, it makes an impact in them. These people who are awakened learners, responsive learners, and they are active learners, they are teachable learners. They are bendable. You can mold them. And the word of God has influence on them because they're teachable. Why are they teachable? They're seeking learners. They're seeking something. I want a solution to this moral problem. I want a solution to this spiritual problem. And because they're seeking, that's why it makes such impact in their lives. They don't remain sinners. They become saints. They don't remain babes. They remain real matured people. They do not remain ordinary witnesses. They become apostles and teachers. They are prayerful learners. They take everything they learn to the Lord in prayer. And because of taking it to the Lord in prayer, that's why those changes happen to them. Actually, they are heavenly-minded learners. Their hearts are set on heaven. And whatever will make them get nearer to heaven, that's what they want. That's what they're seeking. That's what they're learning. That's what they're praying about. Let me show you their attitude in Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34. I read from verse 31. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will offend, I will not offend anymore. That which I see not, teach thou me. That's the attitude that benefits from the word of God. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. In Psalm 25, reading from verse 9, Psalm 25, verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. When someone is meek, when someone is humble, when someone is tender, and when some, someone is moldable, or when someone is meek, he teaches God, teaches him his way, I say. Chapter 48, 
Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, which teaches thee to profit. That's the purpose of God. He doesn't want us to come in vain. He wants us to profit. Profit by salvation. Profit by change of heart. Profit by transformation of life. Profit by having the benefit of all the promises of God. It says, I am the Lord thy God, who teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee in the way by the way that thou shouldest go. I pray that the prophet of the world will come to every life tonight in Jesus' name. The prophet of the world will come to your life. I said it will come to your life. You'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. As we look at Mark chapter 6 tonight, verses 1 through to 13, the topic is Christ's demonstration and delegation of his mighty ministry. Christ came from heaven to demonstrate a mighty ministry. Not only to demonstrate, but to delegate a mighty ministry. Let's come to chapter 6 of Mark, verse 2. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, amazed. They were surprised, saying, From whence has this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? The demonstration of a mighty ministry. And then we come to verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve. And began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. He gave them power. He delegated that same might, that same power, that same authority unto them. Christ's demonstration on the one hand, and delegation on the other hand of his mighty ministry. Verse 12. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils. The power, the anointing, the authority had been delegated to them. And they anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Christ's demonstration and delegation of his mighty ministry. Three things we're looking at as we go through these verses. Number one, the amazing response to his matchless ministry. It was a ministry different and higher than the ministry of those who have come before him, understandably, because is the Son of God, because is the Messiah, because is the Christ, because is the very power of God, because actually in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, because is God, the Son of God, because of that, they were amazed at the mighty, matchless, miracle-working power and ministry of Christ. Point one, the amazing response to his much less ministry. Number two, the assigned responsibility of the Messiah's messengers. These apostles, these disciples, were the messengers of the Master, the messengers of Christ. And he appointed them and gave them responsibility 
and they were to follow that assigned responsibility. Point number three, the adamant rejectors of the Messiah's message. There were those that were adamant, and even they, they saw demonstration of power, and they saw delegation of power, yet they were adamant in their rejection of the message coming from those apostles from the Messiah. Let's come to point number one. The amazing response to his much less ministry. Look at Mark chapter 6. I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. And he went out thence and came into his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, amazed, and surprised, saying, From whence has this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? And even such mighty works, mighty works, Mighty works are wrought by his hands. That surprise will find in different parts of the Gospels. Look at Matthew chapter 13. Reading from verse 54. Matthew chapter 13, verse 54. And when... He was come into his own country. He taught them in their synagogue. It's so much that they were astonished. And said, Whence are this man, this wisdom, notice what follows, and these mighty works. It surprised them that he had such power, such authority, and such demonstration of mighty deliverance coming from his ministry. Luke chapter 4, verses 31 and 32 still expresses how surprised they were because of his mighty work. It says in Luke chapter 4, verse 31, and he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he taught them on the Sabbath day. Have you noticed his teaching proceeded, came before the miracles, the healing, the deliverances, the statue, and they were astonished. They were surprised. What were they surprised at? They were surprised at his doctrine. For his word was with power. His word was with power. For those who listen to Christ with the right attitude. For those who listen to Christ with the proper condition of heart. His teaching brought transformation. His teaching came with power. His doctrine came with or led them into discipleship. And his message produced miracles of salvation, miracles of healing, miracles of deliverance, miracles of purity and power. I pray that today the teaching of his word will produce the same practical, positive, powerful effect in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. But if that is to be so, look at the attitude we ought to have. And look at the disposition we ought to have in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Acts 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word 
with all readiness of mind. That's the secret. Receiving the word, receiving the doctrine, receiving the teaching with all readiness of mind. And they search the scriptures daily, whether to see that those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and as they believed, they were saved. As they believed, they were healed. As they believed, they were delivered. As they believed, the word they believed what mightily in them. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women which were Greeks and of men not a few. Let's come back to Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 6, we're reading from verses 3 and 4. Mark chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon and are not his sisters here with us and they were offended at him they knew so much of the natural they missed the supernatural they knew so much of history and they missed his healing they knew so much of his natural family and they missed the spiritual fellowship. The question was, how is this man doing this? How could he manifest such power? How could he have such demonstration and such great majesty? Is this not the carpenter, the carpenter's son? Is it not the son of Mary? Don't you know his brothers, James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon? Even his sisters, are they not with us? And because of that concentration on earthly things, natural things, physical things, they miss the glory, and they miss the demonstration of the power in their lives. Verse 4, For Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor a prophet is not without honor when a prophet goes beyond his own local community he has honor when a prophet goes to people beyond his own environment he has honor when a prophet goes beyond his little circle he has honor when a prophet goes beyond his village, his town, he has honor. But when he remains in his local village, remains in his local town, remains in his local community, because of the stories they can tell, we know him, we know his background, we know he trained as a carpenter, and we know the name of his mother. And we know the names of those siblings that honor his laws. But it is to their own laws. Because then they lose the manifestation. And they miss the demonstration of his power. Look at verse 4. Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor. If he goes to the right place, I'll have the same, I'll have a glorious demonstration. If he goes to people in need, and the people who are seeking help from on high, and they're seeking the power of God from on high, he will have appropriate demonstration. But in his own country, and among his own king, and in his own house, those who are preoccupied, with natural things, with external things, with the outward form, and with family members, they become the losers. And there are those situations today where you know a preacher, you know your local pastor, you know your local overseer, 
regional overseer or state overseer or national overseer. They're so close to his family. You know his children. You know his wife. And you know the people that surround him. You even know his village. And you know all the surrounding. That knowledge can make you miss the supernatural. They lost the eternal. They missed the supernatural. They lost the mighty works and the wonders of salvation. All that they missed. And they missed the wonders of healing. They missed the wonders of deliverance. Beyond that, they missed the wonders of heaven. They lost their chance to get saved. They lost their chance to get healed. They lost their chance to get to heaven because history prevented them from heaven. The knowledge of history prevents them from the experience of heaven. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 3, chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 prophesying about Christ, the one that is to come. Here is what Isaiah said even before he came. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him, there is no beauty in him that we should desire him. That's what happened to them. They couldn't see any beauty in him, any glory in him, any majesty in him. They were even surprised. How is this happening through his ministry? With his family background, with his brothers that we know, with his sisters that we know, and with all the little village information we have, how could this be happening? Look at verse 3. Is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. It was fulfilled on them. I pray that negative prophecy will not be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. John chapter 7. In John chapter 7, reading from verse 15. John 7 verse 15. And the Jews marvel, saying, how knoweth this man let us, having never learned, we have made our research, and we have seen that the man has not even gone to the regular school, the school of the Sanhedrin, of the Pharisees. He never went there. And yet he comes and he demonstrates such power. You know what the Lord was telling them, verse 24? judge not according to appearance but judge righteous judgment don't look at things after the outward appearance but look at things after the spiritual appearance second corinthians chapter 10 verse 7 second corinthians chapter 10 verse 7 do you look on things out after the outward appearance? Are you looking at the natural height? Are you looking at the natural posture? Are you looking at the physical? Are you looking at the background of the family? Are you looking at the fact that he was a carpenter? Are you looking at what he was before he was revealed to the nation as the Messiah? Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? Chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 
We're reading from verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen. That's how we benefit. That's how the manifestation of his power and mighty ministry, much less ministry, will become our benefit. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, but the things which are seen are temporal. And the things which but the things which are not seen are eternal. Let's come back to Mark chapter 6. And we're reading now from verses 5 and 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 5. And he could there do no mighty works. He had done a few. He couldn't continue the demonstration of the power. They were the losers. They remained sick. They were the losers. Many of them died prematurely. They were the losers. Many of them were not converted because we were not looking at him as savior. They were looking at him as carpenter. They were looking at him as the son of Mary. They were looking at him as just a regular, normal, poor villager. Because of that, he could yet do no mighty work, save except that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk. Those were the people that came. Those are the people that pushed aside all the rumors they were hearing in town. Those were the people that pushed aside all the things they were talking about in town. And they came to him and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He marveled because of their unbelief in knowing much history. The lost heaven. He marveled at the unbelief, their knowledge of him, and them unbelief and hell. Their knowledge of him and them unbelief as well as hell. We're looking at John chapter 9, verse 30. John chapter 9. Pastachi, the man answered and said unto them, Why? Herein is a marvelous scene. The blind man whose eyes had been opened, he said, I marvel. I'm surprised. The two officers of the synagogue and the two Pharisees, are you doctors of the law? You're saying that you don't know this man? He said, and where, why, why, herein is a marvelous scene that she know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened mine eyes, and yet he has opened mine eyes. You will not be an unbeliever. You will open your eyes of understanding. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, we're reading from verse 3. For what if some did not believe, shall their unbelief make the face of God without effect? What's the answer? God forbid. They didn't believe, he remained the Savior. They didn't believe, he remained our healer. They didn't believe he remained the deliverer. They didn't believe he remained the redeemer. He took nothing away from Christ. It says, what shall we, what if some did not believe? Shall the unbelief make the face of God without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true. God will be true in your life. But every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sins, and mightest overcome 
when thou art judged. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, reading from verse 20. In Romans chapter 11, verse 20, well, because of unbelief, they were broken up. Because of unbelief, they were chopped up. Because of unbelief, they were cast up, cast out, cast away. And thou standest by faith. Be not high minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he spare thee not. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God. On them which fell severity, those who remain in unbelief, and they fell because of unbelief, the severity of the judgment of God. But toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. You will not be cut off in Jesus' name. I'm coming now to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, reading from verse 12. The danger of unbelief, the destruction of unbelief. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Before you knew the preacher, you had the word, you were saved. You were just considering the word. You don't know his village, his background, his community, his history. All you heard was the word. And because you are not thinking about the man, or the woman you believed you were saved that's how you get healing to you you look at the word you say that's true i believe that i accept that and you're not looking at the man you're not looking at the woman you get healed and that's how you're delivered that's how you're sanctified that's how you're baptized in the holy ghost when you are not familiar with the preacher when you are not familiar with the prophet, when you are not familiar with the pastor, you get the benefit of the word. But when familiarity comes in, the word doesn't mix your face in the heart anymore. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? Not be mixed with faith in them that heard it. I pray the word of God will mix with faith in your heart in Jesus' name. A good amen from the church. Point number two now. The assigned responsibility of the master's messengers. We're looking at Mark chapter 6 and we're reading from verse 7. Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. And he commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save except a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their paws, but be short with sandals and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide 
till he depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear when ye depart, this shake up the dust under your feet, for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. And they went out, like we went out today. I didn't hear you. And they went out like we're going out tomorrow again, where we'll preach the word. And the Lord will back up the word that we're preaching in Jesus' name. You lift up Jesus, and he will draw all men unto himself. Look at verse 12. And they went out, and they preached that men shall repent, and they cast out devils, and they anointed with oil. Then many that were sick, and they healed them. And he healed them. Give me a good amen. amen. As we look at those verses I've read to you, you see there are three things in their responsibility, in their assignment, and these same responsibilities as we go out, whether it's today or tomorrow or any other day, as we go out and we preach the word of God, these same three responsibilities are given unto us. Number one, preach repentance. Preach repentance. Number two, heal the sick. He gave them power that they will heal the sick. Number three, cast out devils. He gave them power over unclean spirits. Number one, preach repentance. Number two, heal the sick. Number three, cast out devils. Number one, preach repentance to rescue the perishing. Preach repentance to rescue the perishing. That's the reason why we're preaching repentance. It's not just to talk. It's not just to quote the Bible. It's not just to show people their sinners. Sinners are perishing, and we need to rescue them. And it is by preaching repentance to them, and they hear that, that they repent, and they will not perish in Jesus' name. Look at verse 12. And they, they went out and preached that men should repent. Men should repent. What should they repent? Because if they don't repent, they will perish. Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 3. Luke 13, verse 3. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Verse 5. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish look at luke chapter 24 luke chapter 24 verse 45 then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them thus it is written and thus it behooved christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Look at verse 47. And that repentance and remission of sins, plural, should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. In all nations, in all cities, at all times, Wherever there are men that still need to be saved, repentance should be preached. Acts chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 19 and verse 26. 
Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. The sins will not be blotted out if they don't repent. That's why we're preaching repentance. If the sins are not blotted out, it will remain in their record with God even until their days. That's why we're preaching repentance. If the sins are not blotted out and they die, they will go and answer for those sins when they get to the great beyond. In answering for those sins, they will suffer eternal punishment as, as a result of the sins that are not blotted out. That's the reason we're preaching to them to repent. And that's why you should have repented yourself. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. After repentance, there will be cleansing, there will be refreshing, there will be forgiveness, there will be freedom, there will be salvation. Verse 26, unto you first, God, having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you. What's the blessing? In turning away every one of you from his iniquity. Turning away every one of you from his iniquity. Acts chapter 17. Reading from verse 13. Acts chapter 17. Verse 13. And the times of this ignorance got winged out. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. All men in every community. All men in every city. All men in every nation. As we go to them, he commandeth them that they must repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he has raised, whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men, in that he has raised him from the dead. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, he promised that Christ will come again. Was well, he not come? He's waiting for you to repent. He promised that when he comes, the church will be raptured, taken away. Why has he not come to take the church away? It's not slack concerning his promise. As some men count, uh, count him to the slack, is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. Therein lies the salvation of humanity. Therein lies the forgiveness of the sinner. Therein lies the peace we have with God. Men should repent ezekiel chapter 18 reading from versace ezekiel 18 versace therefore i will judge you o house of israel everyone according to his ways says the lord god repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. That's what repentance means. Turn yourself from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. If you don't repent, iniquity will ruin you. If they don't repent, the people we're going to. Iniquity, sin, 
transgression will ruin them. Verse 31, cast away from you all your transgressions, everything, secret or public, private or open, common or not common, every form of iniquity cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will ye die o house of israel for i have no pleasure in the death of him that dies says the lord god wherefore Turn yourselves and live ye. Let's come back to Mark chapter 6, the assignment, the duty, the responsibility the master gave his messengers. Preach repentance to rescue the perishing. Number two. Heal the sick to save the soul. Heal the sick to save the soul. Many people don't understand the purpose of the healing ministry. The ministry of healing is a means of reaching the soul. The ministry of healing is to open up the soul so that that soul will receive the salvation of the Lord and new life in Christ. Think about it. Healing the body and leaving the spirit and the soul in sin is to save somebody from temporary pain and then throw him, body, soul, and spirit into, the, into fire. What's, what's the use in that? You relieve him of pain and then his whole personality is thrown into hell fire forever. Healing the sick is to save the soul. It's to wake him up. See what Christ has done. See the healing he has given you. And he has something greater to give unto you. The salvation of your soul. Have you ever thought about it? That Christ was not healing the sick to give them a license to go and serve Satan, his enemy, with the new strength, with the new vigor, and with the new strength that they had. Look at Mark chapter 10. Heal the sick in order to save the soul. Mark chapter 10, verse 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately, he received the sight. What follows that? Say it aloud. And followed Jesus in the way. You are healed. Not sure. Have license to follow Satan. To follow evil. But to follow Christ. We're looking at Luke chapter 19. And we're reading from verse 10, Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And one way he got their attention is healing their body. He had lettered them, woke, woke them up, so that when they were healed, they would say, who is this? They'll know he's the Messiah, and then they'll follow the Lord. Heal the sick to save the soul. In John chapter 4, John chapter 4, reading from verse 50, 
John chapter 4, verse 15. And Jesus says unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. And he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house himself believed, and his whole house. The purpose of the healing was to draw them to Christ for salvation. You are healed of sickness, so you can be saved from sin. John chapter 5, verse 14. John 5, 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Behold, you are healed. The sickness, the impotence, and the paralysis and the palsy of 38 years is taken away. Behold, thou art made whole. Look at this. Sin no more. Salvation must follow. Jesus is not interested in just healing the body, healing the body. And then the soul is left to go on sinning and to go to hell. Sin no more. Lest it was seen come on thee. Acts chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 32. Acts chapter 9. Reading from verse 32. And it came to pass, as Peter passed through out all the quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at leader and there he found a certain man named Aeneas which had kept his bed eight years bed reading for eight years and was sick of the palsy and Peter said unto him Aeneas Jesus Christ maketh thee whole arise and make thy bed and he arose immediately. Amen? Amen? And he arose immediately. Look at what follows. And all that dwelt at Leda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. That's the goal. That's the purpose. Heal the sick and thereby reach out to their souls and save the soul. Responsibility number one, preach repentance to rescue the perishing. Responsibility number two, heal the sick, but don't leave them only with healing, save the soul. Responsibility number three, cast out spirits to convert the sinner. Cast out spirits. To convert the sinner. Come back to Mark chapter 6, verse 7. Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Verse 13. And they cast out many devils 
and they cast out many devils. They cast out many devils. But think about this. How can we cast out unclean spirits from a man, from a woman, and still leave him or her under Satan's control to continue in sin and uncleanness? That will not be a complete job. How is it? How useful will it be? That a minister says he has a deliverance ministry. He casts out devils, casts out devils, and he leaves the people condemned to uncleanness and to hell. Look at chapter 5. The purpose of casting out the devils is so that those devils will not have any power, any authority, any influence upon them anymore that they will be saved. Mark chapter 5, verse 15. And they come to Jesus, and they see him that was possessed with the devil, and urge the legion sitting and clothed in his, and in his right mind. And they were afraid. His mind was changed, transformed. In his right mind, verse 18, and when he was come into the sheep, he that had been possessed of the devil pleaded with him, begged him, prayed him that he might be with him. He wanted to continue with the Lord. When you cast out unclean spirit, evil spirit from somebody, don't just go away, don't just leave him there. And then he goes back into unclean life, unclean character, unclean behavior, and he still perishes. What she is is that to give him temporary deliverance, and then he spends eternity with the devil and unclean spirits in hell. In Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 19, verse 18. Acts chapter 19, verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and punched them before all men. And they counted the, the price of them and they counted the price of the things that were bought and found it 50,000 pieces of silver and so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed what if the devil comes out of somebody and you don't leave him you don't lead him to salvation what if you have the power, you have the authority, you have the anointing, cast out devils there, cast out devils there, cast out devils there, but Jesus does not live in the hearts of those people. What will happen to them afterwards? Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, reading from verse 24. Luke 11, verse 24. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and finding none, he says, I will return unto my house from whence I came. If you cast out the devil and don't give them Jesus, they don't have the word of God, they don't have the love of God, they don't have a changed heart in them. The evil spirit will say, and here are the words of Jesus, the evil spirit will seek a place to rest and find in none. He will say, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth his sweat and garnished, yet empty. Then goeth he and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, 
and be entering and dwell there and the last stage of that man is worse than the first because the one who cast out the devil did not complete the job and lead that man to have Christ in his heart the heart was empty he goes back into uncleanness and the latter end of that man is worse than the beginning second peter chapter 2 verse 20 second peter chapter 2 verse 20 for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the lord and savior jesus christ they are again entangled there the evil spirit was gone but he doesn't have power to overcome temptation overcome sin overcome unclean habits overcome evil and then he's again entangled therein and overcome the latter age is worse with them than the beginning that will not be your lord that will not be my lord i said it will not be my lord it will not be your lord in jesus name it will not be the Lord of your converts in Jesus' name. Preach repentance to rescue the perishing. Heal the sick to save their soul. Cast out spirits to convert the sinner. Point number three now. The adamant rejectors of the Messiah's message. The adamant rejectors of the Messiah's message. Let's come to Mark chapter 6, verse 11. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. What does this mean? Adam and rejectors does so reject the message of the disciples, reject the message of the apostles, which the Messiah had given unto them. They said, No, we don't want salvation. No was satisfied with religion no tradition is enough and adamantly they rejected the message of the messiah shake off the dust of the city even under your shoe under your sandals number one shake off their dust as a symbol shake off their dust as a symbol the dust of the city that are under your feet shake them up as a symbol of the time that will come when they will be shaking up as the world is shaking in judgment i say chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 13 I say, chapter 13, we're reading from verse 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Shake up the dust of their city under your shoe under your sandals to remind them a time of shaking is coming and all the earth that are adamant in rejecting the word of god will be shaking off from the mercy of god and they will perish shake up their dust as a symbol 
to symbolize to them a time of shaking is coming. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 25. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. See that she refused not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not, who refused him that spake on their much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Once, yet once more, I will shake not the earth only, but also heaven. That shaking of the dust on the, in their feet shows to remind them that a time of shaking is coming, and all the earth with the sinners therein shall be shaking. Look at verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Revelation chapter 6, we're reading from verse 13. Revelation chapter 6, verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casted her fruit on timely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved, shaking out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief priests, chief uh, captains, and the mighty men, and even bondmen, every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? He shook the dust up to remind them symbolically that the time of shaking is coming. I pray. You'll not be here at that time. Come back to Mark chapter 6, verse 11. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart, then shake up the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that in the day of judgment than for that city. It was to show them their suffering will be greater than that of Sodom. Those who reject the word of repentance, those who reject the possibility and the promise of salvation. Those who reject the message of mercy coming from the Messiah through those apostles, their suffering in eternity will be greater than that of Sodom. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 23. Matthew 11 reading from verse 23. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 23, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee have been done, had been done in Sodom, it should have remained until this day, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment 
then for thee because they did not repent that's what he told them they have seen mighty works and yet they will not repent it says it shall be more tolerable for the city of Sodom and Gomorrah second Peter chapter 3 we're reading from verse 7 second Peter chapter 3 reading from verse 7 but the heavens and the earth which are now by the same word are kept in store reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men ungodly men who reject the message of salvation reserved unto fire I pray you will not be among them Jude verse 7 in Jude verse 7 even as Sodom and Gomorrah the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and warning came but their fornication is more important to them than salvation and going after strange flesh sodomy man and man woman and woman lesbianism and that is more pleasurable to them than the offer of salvation it says as they go after strange flesh they are set forth for an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire eternal fire i will not be there i said you will not be there in jesus name look at hebrews i'm reading from chapter 10 hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for sin the disciples went out and they preached to those people but they were adamant and they rejected the word of god and jesus said shake up the doors of your feet from their town to show them when the time of shaking comes they will not escape to show them that their judgment will be more terrible than that of Sodom and Gomorrah. They sin willfully after they have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and for indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Then in verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. As we come to the conclusion, you come back to Mark chapter 6, reading from verse 11, Whosoever shall not receive you, and hear nor hear you, when ye depart, this shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them verily i say unto you it shall be more tolerable for sodom and gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city you will not reject the word of god you'll come out of the midst of sodom out of the midst of gomorrah and those people who are enjoying their sin you come out of their midst in jesus name salvation is yours sanctification is yours salvation and sanctification separate us from sodom salvation sanctification separate us from sodom second corinthians chapter 6 Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 
I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Don't reject the message. Repent. Turn around. Receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him save you. After that salvation, let him sanctify you. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. You will not perish. Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. Don't remain adamant. Don't remain in sin. Come out of those evils that you have been committing. And then the judgment of God will pass over you in Jesus' name. It tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Depart from iniquity. If a man, in verse 21, therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, a meat for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful laws. Flee. Escape. Flee also youthful laws. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace of them that call on the name of the Lord out of your pure heart. The Lord will keep you from sin. The Lord will keep sin from you. You will not perish. I will not perish. Amen. You will not perish in Jesus' name. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. First Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? And if the righteous castle be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? You will not remain a sinner. You will not remain ungodly. Your name in the book of life will not be taken away from the book of life in Jesus' name. The Lord will keep you. Keep you in righteousness. Keep you standing. Keep you faithful. And when the trumpet shall sound, you'll be there in heaven in Jesus' name. Jude chapter 1. Jude, only one chapter, verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. That's your portion, eternal life. Eternal life. Verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, or to present you faultless, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy unto to, to the only wise God 
our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. The glory of God will be in your life. Salvation of the Lord will be in your life. Christ has the power. He demonstrated the power and is delegating that power unto you. You will not remain an unbeliever. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. And as you believe the promise of God, as you believe the power of God, that power delegated in your life, it will work mightily in Jesus' name. You believe the promise of salvation, salvation comes. You believe the promise of sanctification, sanctification comes. You believe the promise of delegated power and authority. That delegated power also comes. You believe that as you go out, the Lord walking with them, he will walk with you. And then you'll bring many sinners to repentance to rescue the perishing. And you'll bring many sick people to healing so that their souls will be saved. And wherever there are evil spirits, unclean spirits, the power is in your mouth. You speak, they'll be cast out in Jesus' name. Rise up and pray unto the Lord. Take everything to the Lord. Remember what kind of hearer and what kind of learner you ought to be. You'll not be a superficial hearer, just hearing everything and everything's lying on the surface of your heart. You'll not be a faithless hearer, not mixing the word with faith in your heart. You will not be a prayerless hearer. You have heard and then you are not praying. You must pray. You'll not be a nominal hearer. You will not be a dull hearer and you will not be a carnal hearer. The word of God will work mightily and majestically in your life. In Jesus' name, open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Tell him, tell him, tell him that this word will work effectually. This word will work effectively in your heart and in your life. Tell the Lord, I am an awakened learner. The word has wakened me up. What I didn't know before, now I know. What I didn't understand before, now I understand. And that wakes me up. And I'm telling my soul, I'm telling my spirit, wake up. Wake up. You have heard the word of God. Let it bring conviction. You have heard the word of God, let it bring persuasion. You have heard the word of God, let it bring progress. You have heard the word of God, let it move you on. Awakened learner. Awakened learner. Are you a responsive learner? You have heard and you are responding to what you have heard. Are you responding? Are you saying, yes, Lord? Like those disciples responded, I respond. Like they went out. I go out. They went out believing. I go out believing. They went out with assurance. I go out with assurance. A waking learner. Responsive learner. An active learner. You are not dormant. Active. You are not quiet. Active. You are not retarded. Active. And just lying down, actually, you have heard, and the word you learn makes you actually teachable. It's added to your knowledge, it's added to your understanding, and what is added to your knowledge works in your life, works effectually in your life, works powerfully in your life. You are meditating on that word you have heard over and over. You are planning on that word you have heard over and over. You are making progress because of that word. You walk on the word. You lay by the word. Achieve learner. Teachable learner. You're seeking something. More understanding. You're seeking something. More revelation. You're seeking something. More transformation. You're seeking something. More strength, you're seeking something. More enlightenment, you're seeking something. More dedication, you're seeking something. Lord, help me. 
that what I learn will make me have more progress, more dedication, more self-denial, more obedience, more diligence, more practical activity. A prayerful learner. You are taking every point, taking all those verses to the Lord in prayer. Prayerful learner. You learn, you pray, you're saved. You learn, you pray, you're sanctified. You learn, you pray, you're more dedicated. You learn, you pray, and the word is reproduced in your heart. Prayerful learner. Consecrated learner. What you learn makes you to go back to the altar and lay everything on the altar. Your life, your time, your skill, your knowledge, your revelation, lay everything on the altar. Heavenly minded learner. Be a heavenly minded learner. That's what you learn. Makes you to think of heaven more. Makes you to seek heaven more. Makes you to be qualified more for heaven. Christ is still the same as it was yesterday. So he is today. As he is today. So he is every time. His ministry is matchless. And he still has the matchless ministry today. He has the mighty miracle working power today. And he taught them. His teaching brought transformation. What you are for tonight is his teaching. Let that teaching bring transformation in your life. His doctrine brought discipleship. Let the doctrine you have learned tonight lead you to a more serious discipleship. His message for the miracle of salvation real salvation great salvation miracle of holiness that was his message always brings his word was with power let the power of the word walk in you mightily tonight he loves you And his word will not go back to him void. Much less ministry of salvation. Much less ministry of sanctification. Much less ministry of divine healing. Much less ministry of total deliverance. Much less ministry. Of personality transformation. You accept the word. You believe the word. You embrace the word. You have faith, implicit faith in the word to walk mightily in you to prepare you for heaven remember those who are looking at natural things physical things and they thought the new Jesus 
They're looking at externals. The new, his local family, his local village. They could tell history. They could spread rumors. They missed out. Don't be like that. The history, they knew was useless. But they brought up belief unto them. Led them to hell instead of heaven. Look away from things that are natural, physical, external. Look at things after the spiritual realm. And let the supernatural world work in your life. And you know, Jesus doesn't only save. He gives you the message of salvation to go and preach to other people. You have repented? Then go out and declare repentance. You have repented? Take it as a duty that everywhere you go, you will declare the word of repentance to rescue the perishing. Don't let them die in sin. God is not willing that any should perish. Have the mind of Christ. And be not willing that any should perish. Your neighbors, your friends, your relatives, your co-workers, and the people you meet on the street preach repentance to rescue the perishing. Preach it lovingly or preach it. Preach it courageously or preach it. Preach it wisely or preach it. Preach it persuasively. But preach it. Preach it pungently. Preach repentance. Let the people that hear you be in no doubt at all. Except they repent, they will likewise perish. Heal the sick. But make it as a stepping stone to save their soul. Heal the sick that are there. But don't stop there. The souls must be saved. Cast out devils. Don't stop there. Convert the sinner. Don't be satisfied with a partial ministry. Partial ministry that doesn't save any soul. Partial preaching that doesn't bring repentance. Partial prayer that doesn't lead to conversion. Partial deliverance that doesn't deliver them from the hands of the devil from the control of Satan. Preach to them. Wake them up. Turn them away from sin. Turn them to the Savior. Warn them of the danger of being an adamant rejecter. Always hearing, but rejecting. Always hearing, but not repenting. Always hearing, and not surrendering their lives to the Lord. Always hearing, 
and yet remaining adamant in the uncleanness. Am I there? The shaking off of the dust of the apostles' feet is symbolic of God shaking the sinners up to the fires of hell. And that if they, if they retain that rejection and remain adamant in their own repentant attitude, they will suffer more than the Sodomites will suffer in hell fire. But remind them, salvation is available. Forgiveness is available. Eternal life is available. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is yours. Sanctification is yours too. So you will not suffer of the Sodomites. Separate yourself from the uncleanness, the pollution, the corruption of the land. In Jesus' name we pray. And the beneficial hearer said, yeah. the teachable learner said, yeah. the Lord will give you more strength. Yeah. He'll give you more understanding. Yeah. He'll give you more revelation. Yeah. And the power to go and reach out to the unbelievers outside and bring them into the kingdom the Lord will grant unto you in Jesus' name. As you go out every time and preach the word, sinners will repent. The sick will be healed. Demons will be cast out. And many converts will come through you to the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. You'll go out for the believers tomorrow. Yeah. I'll go tomorrow. Where are you? I'll go tomorrow. Where are you? The Lord honor your consecration. Yeah. And the Lord honor the preaching of the word in your mouth. Yeah. And the Lord bring people out of darkness. Bring them to the light through you in Jesus' name. Yeah. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you because you've exposed your mind and your truth and the gospel unto us. We're asking, O oh Lord, everything we've heard will bear fruit in every life in Jesus' name. Your revelation will be indelible. Your teaching will be transforming. Your doctrine will deliver everyone. And we pray, Lord, tonight, everything we've heard will become part of our lives in Jesus' name. And as we gave those early apostles and those early believers and those early, early disciples, you gave them power and you gave them understanding and you gave them authority, the same due for everyone here today in Jesus' name. The skill to preach the word. The ability to preach the word. The persuasion to compel sinners to repent. Give it to all your children in Jesus' name. The authority of the name of Jesus that you gave them. Give unto all your people. That Lord will hear testimonies from their outreaches in Jesus' name. Power on your tongue. Power in your lips, power in your mouth, and the name of Jesus will work mightily through your mouth in Jesus' name. Will you stand and speak 
Satan will bow. When you stand and you preach, demons will tremble and flee. When you stand and speak, all powers of darkness will be destroyed in Jesus' name. Receive power. Receive authority. Receive anointing. Receive the mighty spirit of God in Jesus' name. You'll go out tomorrow, you will do exploits. Sinners will not reject your message. Backsliders will not reject your love. And the sick will be healed through you. Manifestation of power. Manifestation of authority. Manifestation of the anointing that breaks every you. Through your life in Jesus' name. And since you are going to be a deliverer, you yourself, you are delivered. Since God is going to use you to heal the sick, you yourself, you are healed in Jesus' name. You carry victory everywhere you go. Triumph everywhere you go. And the Lord will make a way, a hedge of fire around you. Nothing evil, nothing unclean will penetrate into your life anymore in Jesus' name. As you go, be more than a conqueror. Talk more than a conqueror. Achieve more than a conqueror. And let the ministry, mighty ministry of Christ, walk through every one of you in Jesus' name. I am delivered, praise the Lord. I am delivered, praise the Lord. I am delivered, praise the Lord. I am empowered, praise the Lord. The Lord confirm it in your life. Well, thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray.